I think we're close enough. We can get started. All right, well, uh, welcome to simplifying pillar management with forms and formulas in SUSE Manager. And uh, my name's Rain Curtis, and uh, I lead up our core services consulting team for North America. And uh, this is Patrick Swartz. I'll let him introduce himself. Hey, guys. Uh, Patrick Swartz. I'm a sales engineer for the central US. Um, and I just celebrated my one year anniversary at SUSE. So, yay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Patrick's also uh, uh, very comfortable with salt as well. So um, he's going to jump in and keep me honest on all of this as well. Okay. So let's talk about our agenda. So we are going to take some time to uh, talk about Pillar and what it is and the things you need to know about it uh, and how it's very powerful, but there are a few things that uh, we want to follow to uh, make sure we understand it. Then we're going to talk about how does SUSE Manager integrate into this Pillar system of SALT and what do we need to know about that because we definitely don't want to break SUSE Manager as we're trying to implement more features and functionality. And then we're going to take that knowledge and we're going to apply it to building forms and formulas uh, within SUSE Manager. So we do assume that you have a basic knowledge of SALT. If not, um, hopefully uh, for the subject matter we can kind of keep you somewhat involved. All right, so uh, here's what we're going to talk about. Um, when we uh, talk about pillar data. And so when we say things like uh, static pillar data and, and what does that mean, um, the first thing I would say is when we look at pillar data, salt, <coughs> excuse me, salt uses all sorts of puns, right? There's grains of salt, there's pillars of salt, um, there's a salt thin uh, component, there's all sorts of, of salty things in there. And so the shaker, and the shaker. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and there's different types of salt. So. Um, We'll, uh, we'll try to keep a focus and keep everyone uh, involved, and, but specifically talk about what pillar is, right? Um, and how, what we're going to store in it, how we're going to store it, what we need to be aware of. Um, and then this one. This one can be a little tricky as far as what's in memory and uh, what's on demand. And so we'll make sure we understand that as well. So when we talk about uh, what is a pillar of salt, the, it's really... It's, a, uh, it's centrally managed configuration data, okay? So let's say you wanted to deploy an Apache server, okay? You could put the configuration parameters on your salt master or your SUSE manager, and I'll be using those terms interchangeably. Um, but you'll put your parameters there, and then you can push those values out to your web server. And anytime you need to change one of those values, you change it on the master, and it gets pushed out. So where grains are more like system properties that are system specific, pillars are going to be centrally managed on our master. Now, typically we talk about configuration items. So for example, if I was going to uh, you know, do a web application, I might put the web port in a configuration item or as a key in my pillar data um, and then push that out. But that would be managed centrally on there. But it's important to understand especially in SALT since it's a remote execution framework, is to understand where is the data coming from. And the data is actually on the master. It's compiled on the master. So when a minion requests uh, configuration information, that request has to go up to the master, and then the master will compile it and then send that down to the minion. And what's really happening in the background is it compiles it into a Python dictionary. Uh, salt's written in Python, and so um, that's what's happening in the background is it sends it down into a dictionary actually called Python, or, or excuse me, Pillar. It's a Python dictionary called Pillar, okay? So um, if we look at this diagram, we see that we've got our, uh, our master, and we've defined Pillar data, and we've said that it's going to go to this server and this server, but not this server, okay? And so a couple things we want to understand. Here, I've created a pillar called SSHD config, okay? And typically, we would put that in a flat file and it would be YAML, okay? And so, you see here, I've just put some key value pairs in YAML of what I want my SSHD configuration to look like. So now, when one of these systems requests uh, pillar information for this SSHD pillar, 
that dictionary will get put down and it will be put into memory on that system. Okay? Now, one thing to understand about Pillar is that it's considered more secure than other things in SALT. Um, so, for example, when you add a minion to uh, uh, SALT, to the SALT master, or what you see in SUSE manager under your keys, um, th those RSA keys get um, uh, created when the minion starts, it sends its public key, and all that happens, right? Well, when a system's key gets accepted, there is a shared AES key that is used that everybody has that same key. Everybody's using that. And so, when, when, to kind of compare, when this system right here sends its grains up to the master, because the master caches it, it will encrypt it with the shared key and go up to the master. This will use the same AES key. But that is not the case with pillar data. When a minion requests a copy or a refresh copy of pillar data, it makes a request to the master. The master says, let's generate a session AES key. I'm going to generate that right on the fly. Um, and uh, when we talk about the salt keys, right, um, the minion generated a public private AES or um, RSA key. The master gave its public key when it accepted that key. So now they're using those keys to negotiate this AES key. That is a session key that is used to encrypt this data to send it down. This pillar data is also not stored persistently on the system. Okay? It's only in memory uh, for security reasons. Because uh, it is quite common that I might put maybe rather than SSH, I might have like um, maybe it's a MySQL uh, type of database and I want to set the root password. So I would have a key in here called password. Well, I want to be able to have that sent securely, and so it will be done through that SSH or through that AES key. So, any questions about what's happening there? Okay. Now, one thing you want to be aware of is if I had 10,000 systems and I told them all to refresh their pillar at the same time, that's going to put quite a load on my salt master because it's going to be negotiating uh, AES key 10,000 times for all those systems. So you, you want to be aware of that. Now, when we uh, set up a, a, a salt master, we have uh, one piece of it that is a file server. Okay? And we can serve files off that salt master. Well, and that's what we define as our file roots. Okay? And not only do we serve files, but that's where our states come from, is they come off of that file server, and sometimes we call that the state tree. Now, we have a different location that we put pillar data, and we'll define that in pillar roots. Does anyone know why we would put pillar in a different location than the files? Uh, you may encrypt them, right? Okay, I can encrypt them. That's one thing. Yep. I can, I can generate encrypted pillars. But kind of going back to what I said, like maybe a password, maybe it's a pillar with a password in it. Um, this file roots, every single system that I've accepted its key will see everything in file roots. Okay? Well, I only want my database servers to see that password for the MySQL database. So in pillar roots, I put it in a separate location, and then only the systems I actually give that pillar to will see that specific data structure. So if I was on a system that uh, maybe it was a web server and I hadn't given that, and I said, um, hey, show me the, uh, the MySQL pillar data, uh, it's going to say nothing there, right? It wasn't given to you. So you wouldn't see it. So that's how we would keep that secure. So we do set that up. Um, here's the default location. And this does remain the same when we run this with SUSE Manager. So this does not change. But I could, if I was going to define pillar in flat um, YAML files, I would put them in this SRV pillar directory. Okay? And here's an example of maybe a pillar that I would define for NTP. So here, here's my NTP pillar data for US servers. And so I've created a pillar called NTP. And I've got a, a sub key in here called uh, server with the value and then some options. Likewise, for my servers over in Europe, 
I've got one called NTP EU. And notice it has the same key. Okay? So that's OK to have the same pillar data for two different systems, right? because th there's not a problem. Where maybe it gets a little tricky is if I had defined NTP twice for a system. Okay? Um, and then there are some things we're not going to get into today, but there's um, data merging strategies. Do I want, if I had one system, if I gave this to, um, let's say, a European server, but then I had another pillar that also had an NTP, had this structure in there, um, typically the last one wins um, unless it's a list and then it merges it. Okay? So, how do I, well, I said that only systems that I give that pillar to will see it. So, in this case, um, just like in our state tree, um, we have this top file. Now, when I say top file or the top system, how many people understand what I'm saying? Okay. So, and that's okay because especially if you've used SUSE Manager and you haven't gotten into salt, um, SUSE Manager does a lot of this for you. Okay. But there's this concept in salt called uh, a top system. And as you can guess, I can have a whole directory structure under pillar, but top is going to be at the top of that structure. Okay. And top is where I map out the different pillars for different systems. So in this case, I'm saying I'm going to match on grain. So if a system has a location grain of US, then it's going to get the NTP US pillar. Okay? And notice I referenced the file, but I dropped the SLS on there. If its location is set to EU, and it has that grain of location, then it will get that pillar. So now I've just divided up my pillars to the servers that need them. Okay? Sorry. Yeah. So you can uh, add more into the base. So you can have like this is the US and like uh, let's say a page, uh, anything on the Yeah, yep, absolutely. So so base is your default environment. We don't have time to go into environments, but you could have like a dev and a test and a prod. Um, and uh, it kind of really comes down to, do you want to cross the streams, right, um, on there? Or do you have firewalls that, that, that separate your environments? If you do allow all those to come through, then you can. Um, but yeah, under base, I can, so it's environment, and then it's criteria, and then it's list of systems. So if I wanted all US, I could have NTP, and as you mentioned, maybe um, SSH, um, maybe some security hardening settings, I could list all of those under there and all the US systems would get that. Now, if a system requests uh, a pillar refresh and maybe, maybe up here I had star, okay, well every system is going to match star and so maybe under star that's where I list security settings and then under US if it has a grain of locations that US it would get that. So, it's a, uh, it looks at all of the criteria that it matches, and that's what gets compiled into that pillar dictionary and sent down to the system. Sorry, one more question. So yeah, no problem. So if you have like a star, so we go with, with everything that matches the star, and then let's say I want to uh, add some more things, and then I would go to that location setting and remove that as an example? So the question was if I had star um, and then I had location. So it would be both. If the system matched star, it would get everything under star. If it matched location of US, it would get every plus. Yeah. Yep. So it's additive on there. Yep. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Now, as it says here, pillars are applied in the order they're listed. Um, so the last one typically wins on there. Now, how do we view pillar? What pillar data has been given to a system? Okay. Well, the easiest way is we can, we'll just do salt and I'll do pillar. So there's a module called pillar and I can do items. Okay. And if I do pillar.items, that will dump all of the pillar data. Okay. So I did actually for all systems. Um, notice on here, um, this system actually has a whole bunch of different things. It's actually my build server, so I've got some different build options in there. Uh, group IDs, there's all the software channels. So when you go into SUSE Manager and you say this system should have these software channels, 
it's getting put into pillar data. And there's a state that goes through all of those channels, and that's what writes your repos file for you. Okay? So if that pillar is not set, then obviously you're not going to have any repos on that system. So that needs to happen correctly. But that's how I can look at that. Now, I could also, uh, let me just pick one of these. Let's do, uh, okay, well, that's not going to be a good one. Uh, we'll do it later. Um, but pillar.items, so that when I run that, that actually, the reason why that took a minute is because it actually told the master to compile the pillar and send that down to the system, okay? Um, if I do a pillar.item, it reads it out of memory, so it doesn't refresh, okay? So as you're, if, if you were writing pillar, and maybe we looked at that NTP pillar, and I changed my server uh, to something different, and then I do a pillar.item um, for the NTP, and that value is not updated, well, if I do item, it's because it only reads out of memory. It doesn't go back to the master and say, um, give me a fresh copy of the pillar. Pillar.items does. So we just need to be aware of that. And so that's what we're talking about here. So pillar.item, pillar.get, right, gets a value of, uh, for that pillar. And the main difference between pillar.item and pillar.get is if you want just the value or if you want the key value pair, okay? So if I said uh, pillar.item and uh, group ID, okay, or group IDs, um, that would get just that one pillar, but it would only re re uh, retrieve it from the local memory. Um, if I wanted to actually pull it or get a refresh, then I would need to do pillar.items or a refresh pillar call on there. So this is your best bet, okay? Um, this is, when you run this, you, you will always uh, get the latest pillar. Now, it's a separate call, so I would have to do a refresh pillar, and then I have to do, um, you know, like a pillar.item or something like that. Now, hopefully everybody in here falls in love with salt states. And if you do, then you won't have to run this very often, because any time you invoke a salt state, it will automatically refresh pillar and get the latest data from the uh, salt master, okay? Um, so let me just show you a couple things. How do I know which states are on a system? So if I do server um, server one, and if I do a uh, a show top, that's going to read the top of the the top file for the states for the top system. These are the states that are assigned to server one. These states are going to be reading. Most likely, they don't have to, but most likely they'll be doing, uh, reading this pillar data. Okay. All right. So we talked about triggering that, um, the in memory. Um, okay, let's talk about uh, when we have errors. So one thing, anything that has a .sls extension interfaces with the state system. So when we write a state file, if you've written a state file, uh, you probably, you know, you put a .sls, that's short for a salt state. Um, however, pillars have a .sls. That's because they're, they interface with the state system, okay? And the first step of the state system when it gets loaded is it has the rendering uh, modules. And so that's what pillar does is it goes to the state system, it says render this YAML, and return a dictionary for me. And then, unlike a state, it, the state would go to get executed. The pillar just gets rendered and then returned back to the, the minion. So if you're ever having trouble with, um, you know, a pillar, you have a typo in your pillar and you're trying to chase it down, and this is what you typically see in the log is something like that, and you're like, okay, well, what's wrong with my .sls, right? Um, if you go in, in on the master, this is in the master configuration because the master is the one rendering this, pillar safe rendering error, set that to false, okay? Um, so no, now it's not going to be safe. Now, why is it set to true by default? Well, what if you had a password? You don't want to say, hey, I had trouble rendering password, super secret password, right? 
you don't want that in your log. So typically, that's why that's turned off. But if you are troubleshooting, you can enable that. Okay. So that's, that's a real quick overview of pillars. We can put configuration on there. We build our own structure, and, uh, and then we can read that structure. And I'll talk about how to read it in just a minute. How many people would say they're comfortable with YAML? All right. Uh, what about JSON? Okay. Well, if you're if you're comfortable with JSON, you should be comfortable with YAML because uh, YAML is actually a superclass of JSON. Okay. JSON, in other words, JSON's YAML compliant. It just has more delimiters on there, right? Square brackets and curly braces. Um, but the reason why I say that is it is a dictionary, and that's what we're dealing with here. Now, within Salt. Um, Salt has 21, last I checked, might have more or less, but it has 21 pluggable interfaces, anywhere from authentication modules, uh, logging modules, to execution modules, state modules, all sorts of things. Well, one of them is pillar modules, okay? So you can uh, extend Salt by plugging into this interface and pulling pillar data from another source instead of a file on the disk. And that's what SUSE Manager has done. That's one of the integration points. And so when you issue a command like pillar.refresh uh, or pillar underscore refresh, um, it will read that serve pillar top file, but it also has a Python module that's used that calls into SUSE Manager and grabs information on there. And so th they both return a dictionary that get merged together. Okay. So when we looked at uh, this data on here, like these pause images that I've got, um, these channels, that's all coming from SUSE Manager when I went in and checked the boxes. Okay? So that got added to that dictionary. Here's the actual module. You shouldn't have to uh, necessarily ever uh, go mess with it. But it is that SUSE Minion. And uh, here are some of the things that it will be that will put uh, be put in that dictionary. Um, obviously, the channels and GPG keys for our repos file that's going to get created. And uh, here's an example of what that looks like on there. Uh, looks like we have a, a beacon to find um, groups. So the one thing about groups pillar is um, it can be a little bless you. It's a little uh, tricky to know what group eight is because this doesn't show up as group eight, right? So if you go into SUSE Manager, if you move your mouse over there, if you look down here, that's how you're going to get the group number. Yes. Exactly. And I'll show you that one, because that one's going to come up. We're going to talk about that. But yes, um, that's organization, or, or group system group um, eight on there. Okay, so that's our quick pillar review. Okay, let's get into the fun stuff. So a lot of times we don't want to manage pillar by just manipulating YAML files, um, especially if somebody's new, right? And everyone has different skill levels of uh, comfort, being comfortable with YAML, um, right? All it takes is someone to put a tab in there instead of spaces, and now that's not going to render. So we want to uh, kind of avoid that, and we also want to allow different administrators to be able to have an interface to manage that. And so that's where forms comes in, and uh, forms and formulas. So before we do that, the first thing we want to talk about is creating states in SUSE Manager. So if I wanted to create a state, if I was going to do it outside SUSE Manager, I would cd to SRV salt, and then I would probably come in here and I would create a directory. So here I did one for NTP. And if we look in here, notice uh, there I've got um, my init.sls for NTP, and that's where my state is. Okay? So that's how I would do it outside. Uh, SRB salts the default, and SUSE Manager ships with that, that still in effect. Now, if I wanted to do that, create that state through SUSE Manager, I do it through a state channel. Okay? So um, let me just show you this. So I'll come down 
to uh, configuration, configuration channels. And here I've duplicated that. I had to give it a different name, but I created one called NTP SUMA. Now, just like on the disk, I created a container or I created a folder, right? I created this folder and then I could put my states in there. I could put my comp files. I could put anything I needed in there. Well, NTP SUMA in this case is what I named it really becomes a folder, okay? And look what it, when I created this, because I, I uh, when I came to uh, configuration channels, um, I went, said create a new state channel, and it automatically put that init SLS in there for me, okay? And there's my state that I've written for that, okay? So now I've got that state in here. And the other thing that's kind of nice is, well, I only have one revision of that one. Let's see, I should have some other ones. Um, it also does do some basic version controlling. So as this gets updated, um, you can actually revert to an older version of a state if somebody were to uh, update it and break something. So that's built in there as well. Um, what render is come by default? Um, so it's a, it's a, a basic YAML. Um, if we look at, and I think it does a little bit of Jinja. Let's come in here. Here's where, yeah, here's where you see. So you notice in this state, um, I do have a little bit of Jinja um, indicated there. So you see like it's not really syntax highly much much there, but it does render the YAML on there. Um, so that's, that's how we could define a, a state inside of SUSE Manager, okay? Now a couple things before we jump into the formulas and the forms of this is uh, if I define a state inside SUSE Manager, when I hit save, it actually writes it out to the disk. It's a, there's a copy of it in the database but it also writes it out to the disk. So it writes it out into this directory. So if I were to go out to the console, I would change to this directory. And this is what uh, Anne-Marie was talking about, the organization. So when you install SUSE Manager, everybody has at least organization one. You can have more, but that's your default. So it creates manager org one. And in this case, I had a state called corp SSH. And so, and then there's the init in there, okay? So if I were, wanted to run that state from the command line versus using the UI, I would do state.sls or state.apply, right? In this case, all systems. And then I specify manager org one, corp SSH, okay? If you have two and So if you have multiple orgs um, today, you would have to uh, copy it. Um, it's, if you do it through there. Otherwise, um, you may want to consider, for, if you did have multiple organizations, that I would just put it in serve salt and call it core press SSH and then uh, map it to a, through a top file. Yeah. Um, but they are adding, they are updating the API that you can manage these through the API, which will make life a lot easier. Um, so that's what we talked about that. Um, now, one thing to understand is if I, with my NTP state, if I wanted to also push out an NTP.comp file, okay, then here's the file I want. When I add that file, let me show you what that would look like. Um, let's go to my... Okay, so I say add file, and then it's going to ask me, okay, are you going to upload the file? Okay, um, is it going to be imported or am I going to create it? So in this case, let's just say I'm going to create it, okay? And then here, I'll do like um, Etsy, NTP conf, and then I'm able to just do server, um, Oh, already had it created. <laughs> the question might be stupid, but what's the difference between upload and export? 
Um, let's see, look here. Let's see here. Import, um, you already have it uploaded. You're importing it from another config. Okay. Or, or another managed file kind of thing on there. Um, okay, so now if I say list files, so there, I have already put it on there. In fact, let's see what it looks like. Okay, all right, so I did already have that. Now, um, if you're familiar with writing the salt state, the, uh, the Etsy uh, NTP comp, that's the, that's the name of the managed file on the target system I'm managing, right? Um, now, it's going to pull it from the salt master, and because of this integration, it's going to put it in manager org one, NTP, or NTP SUMA is actually what I called it, and then Etsy NTP comp, okay? So that's where you would see it. But you, you don't want to modify it here because it's all, anytime someone changes it in the UI, it's going to override it on here, okay? And so that's what we're talking about. Now, um, I had it here. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so this, this slide here talks about the, the previous slide, the, the directory, the, the, the file base, the, the forms where we're going to store things, where you're going to write them yourself, you know, VI, whatever is in Surf Salts. If you're going to do them through um, uh, System Manager, you're going to do them, they're going to be done through the UI or via RPMs, and they're going to be stored in, in the uh, System Manager directory we had a, a minute ago. Um, yep. Yep, absolutely. Now, when we talk about formulas, does anyone know the difference between a uh, salt formula and a salt state? So they can be the same thing. Typically, though, when we talk about formulas, um, we're talking about a collection of states. So for example, if I was going to, using my example of deploy a MySQL database, I probably wouldn't have just one state to deploy it. I'd probably have one that would be install the MySQL database. I'd have one that would provision users into the database. Maybe one state that grants access to the users. Maybe one that actually creates database instances, right? And so all of those are a formula that, um, of how those get uh, written. Now there's some technical details and some approaches in, in, differ in the difference between a formula and a state, but for our purposes, uh, we'll just, just think of a formula as typically uh, either the same thing or a collection of states, okay? Yeah. The pillar is just a dictionary. Okay. And then your state's going to look up in that dictionary of what it should write. Okay, so it's not like if you use the example of what resources you have, access to, right? So if those are in there, I mean, or is it making a change? It's not making a change. The so the state is reading that pillar that's in memory okay. and then writing the data for example, in, your, in that case, to the repos file. So, so the pillar's not, but the state is reading the pillars to write it. Okay? The data for the state, the data, the data for the state is coming from the pillar. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing is, when we talk, when I said that there's some, some technical differences between a state and a formula, the a formula will be written to be data driven, okay? That, and what, what I mean by that is, I, if I want to change the behavior of how the f formula or the state executes, I change this data structure. And so the concept really is, you shouldn't have to know what the formula is doing. Um, you would just change the pillar data and then the formula would make that change for you. So that's the design difference. And as you get into it, it, it makes a little more sense. Um, but formulas, as uh, Patrick mentioned, can either be distributed through an RPM, and, uh, or they could be, you could just, if you're creating them for your own organization, you just play, put them in a directory structure. If you are doing that RPM-based uh, formula, 
then these are those locations of where those will be. Um, this is where you would want to put yours, okay? Unless you do it in SUSE Manager, and I'll show you both ways, okay? But the, the forms and formula is going to have a location for the state, but then we also need the metadata. Well, what do I mean by metadata? Let me show you. So I'm gonna, we're going to go ahead and kind of show like the baked cake, and then we'll come back and show you how to bake the cake, okay? So I'm going to go to this server one here, and I go to formulas, and as I look at those formulas, so I've played with a few formulas here, and I've created them, and what's kind of nice is I can actually categorize them, and I can write a formula and say, I want it to be part of general system, or uh, in, in this, and that's all my general system. Here's one I did just for SAP. I've started um, to create SID users, and I'm going to add some more SAP. So I can categorize those, and then that way, you might want to have one called like uh, security, and, and maybe I'd have open SSH, maybe I'd have um, hardening settings, right? And then when I hit save, what happens is now I have a new tab. So I just added open SSH, and now I have a new tab here, okay? When I talk about this, here, I'll back up if you want to get a picture. So there's that. You can add it to a system group as well, yes. And then you can use your activation key and say when this system comes in, it has these repos and it's a member of this group, which also means it gets these, this formula that I've set these values on, okay? Uh, they, the groups are exposed through um, pillar data. Yep. And um, so this form, this is, what, this is just what I put together, okay? And this is what we're going to talk about. Now, rather than having to edit flat um, YAML files, we can have people just come in and use this, and now we're going to be less likely to have typos, okay? And so, for example, on here, if I want to disable X1140 for this server, I hit that, I hit save, and now its pillar data is going to have that. So the next time this state runs, it will rewrite those settings. So it, it, still, um, it, it still needs some, uh, it, it could use some stronger things. Now, some of them, like for example, on here, I kind of dealt with that by doing a number uh, uh, counter, right? So the, there are some things, um, or you could do a drop-down list, but, but as far as the actual syntax checking, no. Uh, that's not here yet today, okay? Now, some of these also, though, Oh, I was playing with that one. I wondered if I broke it. Looks like I did. We'll go to my SAP one. Okay, so for my SAP, notice on here I've got one user, and now I've got a subform. Okay, so every time I add a new SAP user, I need to know all of this information. So now when I come down, if I'm going to add another one, I hit add, and notice it now drops that subform in here. Okay. Now, what that looks like at the command line, okay, is notice there's SAP users, my SAP users pillar. By saving that form, hitting save, it wrote this for me, okay? And so now, I just write a state that says, Basically, and I'll show you, for every user in SAP users, call user.present and set these values, okay? With a little bit of ginger in there. Yes. Okay, so that's true. It's not... So, now, let, let's talk about that. So, what that's doing is... Um, I can do two different. I can do two different things. So in this case, in this simple example, I do. Let's show the password. Okay. So it is set to Sousa. Okay. I can do two different things. I could generate a, a random password on there, or here's. I could. I could uncheck this box and actually hash the password and put it in there. 
what I did is said, um, we're going to have it SUSE, but then when it actually runs, it will hash it for me. So you can do it either way. We haven't applied this state yet. And so we've just applied the pillar uh, infrastructure behind it. Yep. And the other thing is, is this enforced password, if we were to go look at the SALT documentation for what a user.present does, one of, the ar one of the arguments is this enforced password. And what that says is, um, if, if, if I apply this state, and let's go to one that's created. If I go to the state and I have this SID3 user, if that user already exists and has a password already set, then I'm not going to set this password. Okay? Um, I might want to. I might want to say, no, the password has to be this, and then that's when I would check the box. But I wrote the form based on what that module does. Okay? So let me just go back, and then we're going to jump into an example. All right, so let's talk about developing this. Um, we want to think about, it, it does add maybe another layer of complexity as far as our design, um, because we need to think about what's that structure going to look like in a form? What's the pillar structure going to look like? Um, and then we want to look at the state, because the state's going to consume or read that pillar structure in our environment, okay? So, um, I'm going to do this actually a little bit differently than do the slides. I think it might. Okay. So this one I actually wrote as an RPM. Um, so it's in user share, SUSE manager, uh, formulas, metadata. Okay. And let's go to NTP. Okay. Now, a couple of things here. Um, I'd always recommend documenting, and, um, but I would also always do a pillar.example, okay? That way somebody knows this is what that form should create, okay? So if I cat that pillar.example, okay, here's what, it, here's what it should create, okay? Now, what I do is when I go to uh, this form.yaml, if you notice on here, what I do is I actually, let's do this. Um, is I usually start with my pillar structure and then I start marking it up, okay? And what I mean by that is, okay, so I want my pillar to be called NTP, okay? And then, uh, actually, let's do this. Uh, let's just copy this. Okay, and then in here, uh, this is where we look at the docs, and I can say um, TP time sync, and then I could say like um, type would be group, as it shows over there. Um, I, and then now I'm going to go to the first key in here, okay? So now I come in here, and actually let's do this. Um, I make it a little easier to see. So server, okay, that's going to be my first sub key. So now in server, I'm going to come in here, and um, that's where I can put, like, a default. So in this case, let's say I do a default for what the server is going to be. And <sighs> my gosh, sorry. Oh. Okay. Okay. Okay, so now, like for server, I've just set a default for that, okay? And then I could do something like uh, uh, type in here, and um, we could do like text, for example, okay? Now, over here, oh my gosh. Here's actually what I did is I made it a drop-down list. Okay, so I said type is a select, 
And then here's the drop-down list, and those are the values that will show up in the list. Okay? And then I did set the default. Okay? So that's why I say a lot of times, um, if we go back to here, let me delete this. That was my initial pillar structure I was trying to create. And so I just add some of those dollar sign tags around there. And that's how I get my form. Okay. Now, that takes care of the form. But there is this other little file here, this uh, metadata. And uh, you really just need a description and a group. Okay. And what that does, whatever I put in there, That's where that got set. So why is NTP under infrastructure? Because I said its group was infrastructure. Okay. So those two files, you can take an existing state that's using some pillar and create those two files and uh, now have an interface to manage that. Yeah? The group uh, value here, is it an ID that is of something that is defined somewhere else? Or is it just some random string? It's just a string that gets rendered. Okay. Yep. So, um, for example, is if I were to, uh, my, we'll, see what it, we'll see what this will do to my season manager. It should be OK. Uh, let's say I change that to infrastructure stuff, OK? And I intentionally did an underscore, OK? So now let's refresh this page. And now it just moved to infrastructure stuff, OK? okay. OK, now um, I just want to show you um, the, the state for that, OK? So in this sense, like I said, since it's RPM, and then we'll use the, the file, and then I'll show you Susan Manager if we have time. Um, oh, yep, let's see that. is happening. OK, we're going to start over. <laughs> oh, my heck, all I hit is V. That's weird. I don't know. Oh, I know what it is. OK, so this one is uh, probably not the best example. I was going to use something different. OK. This is maybe a little more complex. So what I did is uh, this line right here, what I did is uh, I've got platform specific things. So for example, um, the RPMs are different on like Red Hat than they are on SUSE, right? And Ubuntu. So what I did is in that map.jinja, I just mapped them out and said, hey, if you're Red Hat, these are your packages, anything. And then I import that. So that's what that's doing is from there, I'm importing it as OS map. So we don't have to worry about that. Um, but then here I'm uh, running that. Um, let's jump down to actually probably the easiest would be. So oh by the way, what I usually do is if I add Jinja to this file, I usually put a dot Jinja at the end of the name because now somebody knows. Um, that there's Jinja in there. It's not a working NTP conf. It needs to be rendered by Jinja to work. Okay? In Jinja parlance, it's actually not a file anymore. It's a template. Okay? Um, but if we jump down here, there I'm doing a pillar.get. Okay? So pillar.get, and I'm getting that NTP server pillar. And in this case, I'm actually saying, by using this function, I'm saying, get that pillar, but if it doesn't exist, then I'm going to default to that value. Okay? All right. Let's go to a simpler example. So if I go to uh, uh, serve salt, uh, or actually let's do serve um, formula meta. Okay? This is where, if, if they're not RPM, you just want to create a formula and forms. This is where you're going to create it. So, this is where I'm going to create the uh, form and the metadata. So 
in this case, let's say I do, uh, um, I was working on this NS switch, okay? So I want to have a form to set the NS switch. Okay, so I come in here and uh, actually just move it since we're running out of time. Okay, so in this case, I've decided to call the pillar NS switch, okay? And then notice it's going to have a password, a group, hosts, right? Um, all those things that would go in the NS switch. Now, what should that write? That's the pillar structure that, I'm, that it's going to create, okay? Because I put it in my pillar.example. Um, let's move this meta back to here, okay? And so I just put it under general system information, gave it a description. So if this is the pillar that it's going to create, let's look at a simple state that's going to use that pillar. So you can kind of see what the state's doing with it. So now I'm going to go to uh, serve salt, okay? And um, I created, and this is also important, it is no coincidence that my state is called NS switch and my directory under formula metadata was called NS switch. They have to be named the same. That's how SUSE manager knows this form goes with this state, okay? All right, so now I come in here and I look at this. So if we just look at this top part, that's just a standard managed file salt declaration, okay? And so I've got uh, the user group mode, okay? Now, you probably have seen source, right? And uh, it might say source, and then you have salt, and something like NS switch, um, whatever on there. Now, you can do that and keep it a separate file, and there are some advantages. In this case, I was just in a hurry, so I just embedded the contents of that file right here in the state. And so that's what contents does. If we do contents, and then I do a pipe, and then everything that's indented now becomes the contents of that file, okay? So notice on here, um, I would always recommend any managed file, I would put a comment saying salt's managing it, so people know that. And then here's my NS switch settings. Now, I intentionally did this differently so you could see it. In Jinja, you can reference, uh, since it's all Python based, you can reference this pillar data, which is represented as a dictionary, either in a Python syntax, so if you've done any Python, that should look familiar to you, or you can do it in Jinja syntax. And Jinja syntax is a dotted notation, okay? So this could have been pillar.nsswitch.password, okay? But I did it in the Python syntax. So either way will work. It's whatever you're most comfortable with, okay? So now that should read those, pill those pillar items, okay? So now... Let's say, uh, I think I did server one. Okay, now anytime you write a state, especially if you're starting to get into Jinja, um, your first question is, does this thing even render, right? Do I, is it even syntactically correct? Can you even read it? So show underscore SLS says, hey, server one, download this state, render it with this pillar data, and if everything's good, then just show me what you rendered, okay? Don't actually run it, okay? Okay, so we're going to do that. Okay, let's go back here. So I just want to make sure, um, oh. So um, if we had time, we'd go over best practices <laughs> that I didn't do. Um, where is it? Oh, there it is. Okay. So what it did is it said, hey, I don't have a pillar called NS switch, right? Um, so I would actually want to rewrite that, that state to uh, deal with that. Say, if you don't get that pillar, then uh, don't throw an error, okay? Um, okay, so here's what I did, and I, I actually did this... Um, where one, I did it as a drop-down list, and I said, those are the valid options in my environment. 
or these other ones I just left as text fields, right? So now I hit save, and now if we come in here and I don't want to have um, so now let's see. Um, um, what do I call it? NS switch. Okay, so now it has that. It has that pillar day. So now let's come through and let's see if it will render. Okay, so it renders. So here's the contents of that file it's going to write now. Okay, so anytime, and like I said, I assigned it to a specific server, I could have easily just gone to a system group and gone to formulas and assigned it that way and then anyone that's a member of that group gets it. Now, if it's assigned in both places, the more specific assignment wins, right? So if this server was a member of this group and it had one setting and then I assigned it to the server, the one on the server is the one that would actually be the one that, that would win, okay? So that's I could change any of those values central, or centrally uh, through my SIS manager form, and any time I high state or I manually apply this state, um, that will get rewritten out to those systems. Okay. Um, let me just do one more thing, and that is when I do these form or when I did this, notice this one says manage org one users. That's because rather I created the state inside SUSE Manager in Organization 1 rather than on the disk, okay? The only gotcha that you need to be aware of is if I go to SRV um, Formula Metadata, I have to name that directory the exact same thing, okay? And if I ever have a question about what it should be, I could do, let's do this, um, I can list states, and if I come up here, notice that's how the minion sees that state. So that's what its form would need to be named as. Okay. So um, that's forms and formulas in the crash course. I know it's a lot of data, but uh, a lot of information. But uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, um, we probably have a couple minutes for questions. Yes, if you, if you look in, uh, if you go to the SUSE Manager documentation and look at the best practices, there's a formulas uh, chapter in there, and that's where you'll see that. Okay. Um, also, uh, SUSE Manager, especially if you have SUSE Manager for retail, um, it actually ships with a lot of these formulas. So when you have like a branch server and you need a DHCP and you need DNS, you need Pixie, there's all the forms that will help you get that set up, and then it deploys it out to the branch server. So, any, any other questions? Okay, well thanks for coming. Thank you.